Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family from whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hand of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and all your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice." The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Hebrews. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who approach. Otherwise would they not have ceased being offered, since the worshippers, cleansed once for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sin year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. 
In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, in burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, See, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands day after day at his service offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting, until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, There is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and said to him one after another, Surely Surely not not I, I, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Truly, I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, Your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, 
I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? He deserves deserves death. death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy 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 to us, us, you Messiah. Messiah. Who Who is is it that that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. Then he went out to the porch. Again, another servant girl saw him. She said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, Certainly you are are also also one of them, them, for your accent accent betrays you. you. Then he began to curse and swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. What is that that to us? See See to it it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. And he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priest and elders, he did not answer, Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he had realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, and to have Jesus killed. The governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas. Barabbas. Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Let Let him him be be crucified. crucified. 
Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let Let him him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His His blood blood be be on us and and on our our children. children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crowd, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, Hail, King King of of the the Jews. Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. They offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by him derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also among the scribes and elders were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, Darkness covered the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This This man man is calling calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, Wait, let let us us see see whether whether Elijah Elijah will come come to save save him. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out to the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake, And what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee 
and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and Mary of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary was there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before, before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers. Go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. This has been a Lenten season and a Holy Week to coin an overused term that is unprecedented. The COVID-19 crisis has us fighting an invisible enemy, an enemy that keeps us six feet apart and potentially lurks in our hugs and our handshakes. All of the things that I have taken for granted, maybe you too, are suddenly things that I long for as I distance myself from loved ones and my neighbors. Like the world described at the end of Matthew when the earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs opened across the countryside, our neighborhoods, our cities, towns, our country, and our world has shifted. Like 9-11, there will be the world before COVID-19 and the world after COVID-19. This is one of those historical moments that forever changes the way we think about our life, our relationships, and what we believe is important. Jesus coming into the world and living as a human was one of those moments. Today we remember that there was a world before Jesus and a very different world after Jesus. Throughout our Lenten scripture readings, Jesus shows us what the kingdom of God looks like. Stories filled with unlikely people helping us to discover what is important to God through Jesus. Stories of real people, often unlikely people, who reflect the challenges and the joys of being human. Stories that remind us that God is with us with us in our uncertainty, and with us when we are marginalized. He is with us when we are blinded by our own pride and selfishness. He is with us in our betrayal. He is with us in our grief. He is with us in our anxiety. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey instead of a stallion, his message was that God loves everybody and doesn't have favorites. His message was a threat to those whose status came from using the law to decide who was righteous, who gets in and who is out. Jesus speaking truth to that kind of power cost him his life. But it wasn't just the religious authorities who bear the blame. Those who celebrated his arrival to Jerusalem earlier in the week were in the crowd condemning him by Friday. He just didn't fit their idea of Messiah. His message of love and inclusion wasn't what they were looking for. His call for them to choose the kingdom of God first 
didn't resonate. They wanted a leader to overthrow the Romans. They wanted a powerful and prestigious Messiah. Not one who ended up being tortured and humiliated and condemned by Pilate. What could this kind of Messiah do for them? In the end, they rejected the kingdom of God and chose justice, not mercy. In the end, it was safer to go along with their religious leaders and choose Jesus Barabbas over Jesus the Christ. Choosing to follow Jesus is still a threat today. He threatens our desire for privilege and prestige. He threatens our desire to accumulate material wealth. He threatens our desire to constantly see ourselves as more worthy than others who are marginalized in our society. He threatens our need for certainty and security. He threatens our need to be right more than our need to be in relationship. He threatens our sense of entitlement. Sacrifice like the crowd that condemned him to torture and death seemed to think would cost them too much. Good Friday is a reminder that in spite of how that crowd and the disciples abandoned Jesus in his darkest hour, a reminder that regardless of how we all fall short in putting the kingdom of God first today, regardless of how we turn our back on the message Jesus brings about love and mercy, forgiveness and redemption, he remains present. Jesus' journey to the cross shows us that there are no places that God will not go to show us the depth and width of his unconditional love. I'm not clear about the historical details of Jesus' death and resurrection, but I didn't have to be present to understand that whatever happened that weekend was so powerful and so significant that it changed the world forever. Whatever happened that weekend changed a group of scared disciples into a group that laid down their lives for the message of the gospel. Whatever happened that weekend was so transforming that people throughout history have continued to tell the stories and create rituals to remember Jesus' sacrifice and what it means for the whole world. I believe that what happened that weekend is the peace in all of us that in times like we are living gives us the courage to persevere and find new ways to be God's people. I see Jesus' sacrifice in our health care workers fighting to save lives while placing their own lives at risk. I see Jesus' sacrifice in all of those keeping our grocery stores stocked and open. I see Jesus' sacrifice in people shopping for their neighbors who need to stay home. I see evidence of the depth and width of God's unconditional love all around me. I see his love manifest in computer screens and school lunches. These are certainly unprecedented times, but we can be sure that God is working in us and through us to show the world that he is the way and the truth and the life. I want to close with a prayer by Thomas Merton that has brought me comfort and reassurance during this time when the world has been turned upside down. I hope you will find comfort in his words as well. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to love as Christ loved does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. 
I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Sing my tongue, the glorious battle. Eternal 
Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, and to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.